Hey, everybody. Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Check it out. Check it out. So, all right, I like to write things, especially about combat. Until other people start picking up my work, I'm just going to pick it up myself. And so I've done that once again. And I'm going to have my man Brad Hutchings do the interview today. So I am the guest. Brad is the uh, the host. And we are covering a paper I just called a monograph paper, whatever you want to call it, that I just wrote called The Afghan Constant. And basically, it kind of gives some lenses, axioms, and tools that I used to alert myself of, hey, this is trouble. Not in the combat sense in terms of like, hey, someone's around the corner going to shoot me, but hey, this is a staff room and there's mistakes being made and it's going to cause us all a lot of problems. And I built these things over time by watching different units make the same mistakes. Like, oh, when I hear these words, alert. When I see these norms, alert. And so I, I try to put all these things into some sort of a, a format that will begin the conversation of how do we do this better? And that's what the Afghan constant is. It helps you to understand in any situation when you hear these kind of values or you want to understand something or you want to know the pace of the work. Well, this is what this is designed to do. So I hope you guys enjoy. It's my attempt to kind of explain really complicated stuff. And hopefully uh, it's one of many conversations. Hey, thank you so much. Here comes Pete Turner. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Young. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. And this is Brad Hutchings, and today we're reversing seats again, and actually not really reversing seats. Pete's reversing seat, and then I'm filling in on his seat. And we're going to talk about his latest essay on Afghanistan, which was uh, fascinating when he wrote it. It really it shook me to the core reading it because it's brutally honest and um, um, it explains a lot. So, Pete, what what give us a give us a quick recap of what inspired you to write this? This is on Medium, so always, by the way. I'm always thinking and writing uh, different things about whatever I see. And, and sometimes it's about Afghanistan and Iraq and combat and that kind of thing. And this is one of those times. And I've been thinking about putting this sort of guide together and I'm just not doing it, frankly. So I have all these maxims and idioms and, and lenses that I suggest to commanders and I use myself in ways I listen to conversations when we're deployed. I, I go, okay, these are issues that I can look in. And keep in mind, I'm a spy, right? So my job is to help the commander win. If I can help the commander see that his unit is doing things the wrong way, it's no different than saying, hey, sir, there's 5,000 troops massed on the back. Your enablers are undermining your ability to win. The commander still wants to know that. So, yes, I focus on tactical, dangerous things, but most of the gold that I provide to a commander is not that stuff. They got plenty of people focused on negative and the threat-based I focus more on the ground truth and, and what's inhibiting our ability to win. So as I try to illustrate these things, we need to have more people like me to be able to do these things, these assessments of how we do, what's going on in town, what's possible, what cultural things can we just shut up and let happen and win with those things. So those are the areas where I focus. That's I've been desperate to write this thing, and I hadn't. So I'm like, let me just get this thing started, and it's going to grow. It's actually, I was writing it. I looked up at the clock and went, oh, crap, we got to record, because I was actually updating the effects and affects section of the paper. Why don't we talk about that first? Why don't you uh, explain effects and affects and what the difference is? Yeah, sure. And and I guess this, this will be updated, um, not immediately, because I'll have to finish writing what I'm writing right now, but the affects versus effects. So... I submit that affects are more powerful than effects. Aff and and the, the section's titled Don Giovanni versus John Hinckley, right? So you got Don Giovanni, Don Juan, who is this guy, he's this Lothario who gets women to love him, even though they know better and they know they shouldn't do it. He just pulls it out of them and he makes them love them. And one of the greatest arias in all of opera, one of my favorite is, is the one from Don Giovanni when uh, Lucretia is like, I love this guy. He's terrible for me, but I can't help it. I love him. Please don't kill him. And then there's John Hinckley, who's so in love with Jodie Foster that he thinks by, in part, killing Ronald Reagan, she'll fall in love with him. These are effect-driven thoughts. The effect-driven thought is like, if we stack enough effort in this direction, um, we will inexorably win. That never works. 
So uh, at least not reliably. The, so the affect side is how do you create that emotional response to your stimuli? That's basically the psychological uh, focused definition of that. So it's emotions in response to the, the thing that you create. So you put a spark out. If you don't have hay and you keep putting a spark out, that's effect based. If you put a spark out and you're like, huh, I need to do something different. Let me go get some hay as an affect based thing. Where I, I, my, my emotional response is I'm tired of putting sparks out and not getting anywhere. What, what happens now, right? So can you make a reliable emotional response to what you're doing? And in a place where uncertainty and fear reign, uh, the ability to bleed that off, to bleed, uh, to create confidence and legitimacy and trust in governmental agencies, that's, that, that's your, that's cash. That, that's like gold in the bank. So here's something you didn't address in your essay that, um, somebody commented with a link to a CNN article on a post you made today. Um, and what was interesting about the article is that it spelled out in Afghanistan in the seventies that was basically Berkeley. It was like a hippie, uh, pardon me, a Kabul in the seventies. that was basically Berkeley. It was a hippie enclave. It was cool. It was, it was very Western. Um, it, women were, were, were treated, you know, respectfully, nicely, certainly in the way that we see is respectfully and nicely. Um, and, um, you know, I, it, it got me thinking a little bit, um, is there a, is there sort of a difference here between say Kabul and the rest of Afghanistan? Yeah, there is. And, and also about that did we, article. That's, did we understand, did we, and, and did we understand that difference, I guess? Okay. Uh, no, <laughs> let me, let me expand. And this is not to knock the author, but they're looking nostalgically at a period of time that was very short in Afghanistan's time, right? Mm -hmm. So Kabul maybe temporarily was like that, but that's a place that's unstable. So it churns all the time, just like we churn as well, but they, they have a more, uh, their churning is at a different level. So yes, Kabul uh, had an area like, an era like that. You hear about women wearing miniskirts all the time um, in Baghdad, same kind of thing. Oh, women used to wear miniskirts and go to the disco. They say that exact line over and over again. So you know that there's some, there's some art in that statement as opposed to all fact. So that's one thing. The next thing is, is yes, the country is different than the city. So if you take, and, and I think, John Green was on recently, and I, there's a clip up on the show about it, talking about liberal urban agenda versus rural conservative reality. And most of Afghanistan is, it, it, rural is probably the nicest that it is. It's rugged, it's hard, it's mountain country. There are no roads. It's like uh, Grizzly Adams, where he lives, and then the big city in most of Afghanistan. And you're not gonna tell Grizzly Adams what to do because he already knows what to do, right? And so when we go into these outlying areas, it is vastly dramatically different than, uh, than what happens in Kabul. Um, Afghans or Afghanis, you corrected me on this in a- Yeah, I, I did I say it wrong? Typo a, no, you did not, you did not, oh. but you corrected me quickly when I made a typo. And I, I felt um, I felt hurt by that. So explain which is right and why it's right and why it's important. Well, it's like Danes and Danish, right? Yes, we say Danish all the time and everybody goes with it. So I don't typically correct anybody who says Afghani because uh, you're not supposed to know. But if you're trying to be in the know, which I believe you are, then I say, hey, listen, I have to correct at this point so that you can understand that we say Afghans and not Afghanis. It's the same thing with interpreters. If you say terp, it means that you haven't taken the time to actually ask an interpreter what they want to be called. And it's typically and usually they, they don't want to be referred to as a terp because it becomes derogatory. And you hear a lot of people use terp in a derogatory way. So Afghan, Afghani, terp, interpreter, there's, there's just different ways to say things. And to be culturally savvy, you know, you've asked that question, like, hey, what's the best way to, what's the best thing to call you? Why don't you just call me Sal instead of terp? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll just refer to you as Sal. That's a good answer. I'm working on my camera here, Pete. Sorry about that. I tried to get too That's fancy right. with that. Um, stability and instability. Let's talk about this. Unstable regions and stable regions. What are we talking about there? Well, why, is that, why is that a global concept? Well, 
because the United States is a very stable place and it's rare, right? Instability has an elasticity to it. And it's at its relaxed state, it is uh, unstable. I don't know how we manage to do it, but we are relatively stable here. Things that are possible here are simply not possible in other places. For example, you can get tacos any day, any, day, any hour throughout the year. Someone is making tacos within, I don't know, 15 minutes of your house and insert whatever kind of food you want for tacos. That's not true in most of the other places. You can call the cops here and you have a pretty good, you have a pretty fair assumption that the cops will help you. If you're getting beat up and there's a cop there, you have a pretty good assumption that that cop will come and make the beating up stop. Whether you were at fault or not, they're going to they're gonna come in and render aid. These are things that are in stable regions. We take a stable mindset to an unstable place, and we forget that the Burmese are better at instability than, instability than we are. And we look at our norms, and we are, we are unable to translate them into instable norms. So, so things that, that seem like menial or, you know, tiny little things to us are vital to that person. Um, you know, think about like an Afghan who has to go out in four degree weather. They don't have Gore-Tex, they have jackets and all that kind of thing, but they have to live outside. So things are a little slower. Um, people are a little later, you know, they're, they're more deliberate. We look at that as being some kind of a, a, de a degradation of professionalism. But the reality is, is that they can handle more hard stuff than we can. When we show up, we bring instability with us. Whatever we put our effort into, creates more instability. So the State Department can tell you that they're teaching Afghan men Microsoft Office Suite, but the reality is they're probably causing more instability than anything else. But And by the way, is there anything more pedestrian than doing that? How about we go to a village and go, women, here's, you have a thing called a period, and then you're going to have to put into your vagina area some feminine hygiene products. We recommend pads. And then the Afghan women, and this was actually happening in Iraq, Afghan women or the Iraqi women go, you know, they, we have tampons here. <laughs> you know, it's not, we know how to use them. And uh, like you, we're well past just pads, you know, but we're so damned arrogant and our place is so stable. We just assume that they don't have any stability. So the instability thing is, is assume as a norm, that whatever you do is going to feed instability until you slow down and externally measure what your impact is of your unit, of your organization on the area you're in. You can be in an NGO and you can go out and teach women how to sew or weave rugs is a common one. We're going to teach women how to weave rugs and we're going to save the world. But if Pete goes back after you and goes talk to that woman or goes talk to the men in that village and I go, hey, what's going on here? They're like, well, that woman's going to get killed because the people that are going to approve this operation who aren't you know, the Americans or the NGO, they haven't agreed to it. And they're actually pissed off by it because their uncle sells all the rugs in this valley. So you think you went out, you made stability. In reality, you made instability and you caused strife. And now it's invisible to you and you're too arrogant to accept it. So when I write the report, you challenge me and I'm like, this is not me saying this. This is the Afghan dude I talked to saying it. And maybe he's wrong, but you didn't even know this existed. So that attitude and that pattern sows instability into the uh, soil that you're trying to grow a crop in. So one of the themes you've talked about in previous discussions on Afghanistan uh, with, with fellow operators is this sense that you go there and you feel like you have a purpose, that the mission is good, that you're going to, um, you're going to make, you know, positive, am I using it, am I using it correct? You're going to have positive affect. Okay. Okay. And okay. sometime, sometime in the whole scheme of things, as you realize um, this doesn't really, what, what I'm seeing on the ground doesn't match what the theory in the book says and the orders say. Um, right. What, what, uh, how long does that take? Let's and, back and is up it really for a common thing? Yeah. Let's come back to that. Remind me of that because I'll talk about affect again for a sec because it's really hard to sure. explain. Sure. And, and that's partly because I haven't figured it fully out yet myself, right? I know it when I can see it. I know it when, when it's operating cor correctly, but explaining it's hard. I wouldn't say it's positive affect. I would say it's on target affect. And so if your, your desired emotional response is belief in the government and you got um, you got a person that's willing to get up out of their chair and walk to the government and consume the government. There's a fraction of trust. You're on the target, but you're nowhere near the 10 ring of, of legitimacy, right? Mm. So I would say on target is the best way to think about it until, until you can reliably say the affect that we should get three days later when Pete shows up should be 
you know, this is the 10 ring, this is the inner ring. If they have anything in this target area, then then we are starting to create the right affects. We are starting to have the conversation because I promise you the Taliban is there and they are causing emotional responses to their actions. They are dominating 100 yards off the American camp. Even if they're not there, the messaging is so strong. They own that fight and we get our ass handed to us every day because we don't ever think about affect. We don't ever go back to the village and say, what happened yesterday? Whether it was good or bad, we never do that. So that's that part. What was part two of your question? Uh, part two of my question is how long does it take typical operator to figure that out? Because it's not just your conversations, but certainly certainly um, conversations with veterans and people who had been in the field that are appearing on the major news networks now are starting yeah. to show that they realize that the mission was BS at some point. They come back and they're not at all surprised by what, you know, the quick collapse. Well, the, the collapse is in a surprise because we, ne to a guy like me, because we never, we never tested the system. We never did a shakedown, you know, and said, okay, we should be able to push budgeted dollars all the way out to the districts, including districts that are off the main route. Can we do that? Uh, no, we cannot. We get mad at a governor who doesn't perform in a certain way. Okay, so we got mad at a governor that I worked with, right? And, and the thought was, is this guy's lazy. He won't go to his district, which was off the main route, and he won't conduct business. He's not governing. And so I go there, and I slowly start to build trust with this guy, and I talk to him, and I was like, you spend a lot of time in the capital city. Why do you do that instead of staying here? And he's like, well, number one, I don't have a budget. I have a budget, but no one gives it to me. So I have no money to do anything here. So I had to pay out of my pocket to pay for my guys to come with me to make sure we all get fed and everything else. That costs me money. That's fine. It's part of my job. And I'll try to get my money back from the government later. But also, and this may be different in America, but you have to go to the capital city because that's where a lot of our business is transacted. So probably half of my time, I need to be back to see my family, of course, but also to go see the higher level ministries, to work on trying to find the right people to hire to come out here. But I cannot operate my business of governance without budget, and I don't have one, and I never get it. And so then instead of saying, hey, what's the deal with the money? We look internally and we say, everybody's corrupt. That's why there's no money here. Well, if that's the case, let's go node by node up the line and figure out where what we need to do. We don't do that internally between ourselves, right? So American partners will partner individually like an island and everybody else is incompetent and crappy, even if they're Americans. And I've tested this by going up the chain to look at a request and see it get killed by an American because they didn't trust the partner that I was dealing with. That person was tied to the Taliban. By the way, I never met that person, just read a card and made a decision. And so it killed, a, imagine like snipping off a piece of the government and saying, snip, that part's dead. And now it will not get any resources. Well, how do you establish a government if you won't allow it to have money? How do you do that? Uh, how do you get money from the government if you don't have tax collectors or if tax collectors are terrified to go out and actually grab taxes? Well, now you have to find some external resource of money. All of these things are part of the machine that has to work to have a government. So when we said we were going to give the thing back to the government, back to the Afghan or the Taliban, I knew instantly, like, there's no way anybody's going to stand up. I, I've taught, I've, Brad, I've talked to so many people about this in Afghanistan and Iraq, like about the collapse that's coming. And they both, they all said it. They all said the same thing. The moment you guys leave, there won't be anything to hold us accountable to ourselves. There'll be nothing here. You guys keep us. You, you may suck at what you do, but at least when you are here, there is a cost, a penalty if someone gets overly violent. And the moment we leave, we're all going to cut a better deal because you guys are the only thing holding us together. Not that we were doing a good job, but we were yeah. holding. We were certainly we were certainly filling a vacuum, you know, and then we we go and we we evacuate the vacuum. It's there and the Taliban fills in. Is the Taliban like what we popularly think of the Chinese Communist Party, that they're so they're so into the grassroots of things that, you know, you're even at a local level, you you have to be a loyal party member or, or are they is it kind of something different where they're just, you know, yeah. kind of the wild guys or Bo and Luke Duke out in the out in the field and. You know, make it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question to characterize because every valley is different. Every set of compounds is different. But I would say this is the best way to look at it. The active Taliban people in the villages are they're not necessarily from there, but they're from there enough that that they are from there. They're of that place. Right. And so they can go out and they can act. There is a hierarchy there in terms of what's driving things. The farmers have no hierarchy above them. Yes, there's some tribe, but that really 
that really is mox nicks here that doesn't really matter too much tribe works for things like hey we had a baby hey my kid's in jail that kind of thing but in terms of of physical influence in terms of uh, bringing violence the only people that can do that purposefully are the taliban and and nobody's going to do a thing about it so they're in effect um, a gang i guess you would say but a legitimate gang it's like the the early 1900s mafia in New York, where where they had judges, they had police chiefs, and they could act with impunity because they had they had the physical authority and they had the audacity to go out and do things. And so you can't go kidnap a guy, snip his pinky off, and then spread that rumor. Right? This is the affect. Now spread that rumor through all the basin area, all the valleys. Hey, hey, they uh, they kidnapped Lenny and cut his finger off. You know, and whether that happened or not doesn't matter because we don't even know who Lenny is. But right. I don't. Know finger snapped off well there's no one on the he's afghan definitely government. missing a thing he's right. definitely missing yeah, a finger someone somewhere yeah. hey and those guys are mean enough that, that it's believable right and so when you look at like jaroa the official government that we created um there's no one out there snipping off fingers matter of fact our leaders don't even have a budget because we don't trust them so if we don't trust them if we don't provide them with resources to govern and i'm not saying they would do a good job they're gonna do a terrible job it's like an 11 year old trying to drive they're gonna do terrible you're this is where the partnering comes in but because we don't even do that, the Taliban have a budget. The Taliban can fix some things, not everything, some things. And the Taliban can also impose a, a penalty for not behaving properly. And, and that has way more weight than us walking through a village and handing out some radios. Where, where does the Taliban get their budget? Oh, man, I don't know. That's, that's not ground truth stuff. That's like, that's like for the colonels and everybody else. Those guys know the answer. Okay wouldn't even try to guess i mean i can make guesses but but i'm not the guy to answer that question okay fair enough ideas you you taught you start out your ideas section your ideas suck you're not original you're not unique you've not solved it yeah yeah you're not the first you to see that i i put the say that again there. say that whole thing again so everybody understands it go ahead your ideas suck you're not original you're not unique you've not solved it you're not the first to conceive this bad idea and you'll not be the last we what, all talk, yeah we all talk what, about the good idea you? fairy you know yeah and then we go out and have our own idea i do it i'm guilty of it it's so fun to think of your idea like oh man i know what to do i know what to do no you don't what you should do is go into the village and figure out what you might want to do by the way there's some great chat going on here in the thread i'm trying to get to all these guys uh especially xander xander is like he's a colonel he's a guy that i would work with directly to go hey sir, you know, this is what's going on in this area. And he'd be like, all right, everybody stop what they're doing. Focus on what Pete's talking about. Let's figure out how to do this. And then I would say, let's not figure out too much. Let me talk to the local elders, right? This mm -hmm. is that idea thing. So you don't want to get too far ahead of the ideas if you're planning in an American conference room, because then you get Western idea. I don't know. You get a poison with Western ideas, right? And so we have to go figure these things out with what's possible here. I, uh, I think I had this slide. I'll pull it up and I'll, I'll show you guys if I can pull it up here. There is a, a slide that I created. Okay, I'm going to load it in. I don't have it here. But I went out and talked. This will sound crazy to you, Brad, and probably all of uh, everybody else who's listening to this. So one of the things we never, ever, ever, ever do is talk to the partner and say, hey, what's your plan for this region? How do we, I don't know, how do we figure out and, and do this, do what you want to do? One of the, and I say this all the time, probably the most powerful thing I ever learned from anybody by doing all this partnership work was there's only room from one sword in the scabbard. And if, uh, if Xander is the colonel and he's, he's uh, in charge, I'm going to say to him, sir, who's the sword? You or the governor? W which guy's it going to be? Now, the colonels get it, but making that sword a good sword, letting us actually let that sword be the sword is a different thing. So saying it and getting it and then actually employing this are different. Things. So what we did with this governor was, I extracted from his plan how he wanted to provision his timeline, his priorities, all of these turned to a, uh, a useful uh, PowerPoint slide that we could all look at. And if I can do two things at once here, I'll, I'll find and pull that up. When we talk about ideas and what we're due, and I'm like, hey, ask the elders. These guys have an idea of what they want to do. And they also have thought, it turns out they've thought about what they want to do and how they want to do it. And they've got a better idea of how because they're from there and they already have eliminated a lot of the things that we don't even know exist in terms of obstacles. He has a great joke in here um, in, in his ideas paragraph. 
And uh, it's degrees are heavily correlated to failure. This is your your degree, like you're from school. If your degrees are high end, your correlation to failure is greater than one. Yes, you're correct. This is impossible. And why you are part of the problem. Um, you, you are definitely going to fail. Oh, I'm now the host of the show. Hello, people. We'll wait for Pete here to come back. Um, and this is, you know, to me, this is, this goes back historically. We've never done this well of, of, uh, you know, taking our ideas and having them planned in Washington and then sending them out to the world. You know, we had, we had, uh, you know, McNamara's boys back in the sixties who were going to plan out the whole war in Vietnam and they failed miserably, um, because they didn't have the information of, you know, the local situation. They just had how the, how the thing was going to work. And uh, and their plans and their plans broke down. Um, we have, you know, obviously a similar thing with Afghanistan. But you know, and it's funny because the Soviets pulled the same thing in Afghanistan in the 1980s, and we learned nothing from it. You know that they tried to they tried to set up stability and you know all these things and fought the Taliban and and uh, the Taliban just waited them out and they got out. And we thought that was you know at, in 1990. Or so we thought that was really cool that the Soviets took it right in the ass from the uh, from the Taliban. But um, I, I filled the space with uh, degrees are heavily correlated to failure. What a great great math joke here! If your degrees are yeah. high end, your correlation to failure is greater than one. Yes, you're correct. This is impossible, and why you were part of the problem. Some of these guys. Um, some another another theme I've noticed, Pete, is some of these. Uh, some of these guys who have their big plans and whatever else, when they come out to the theater and they don't want to, they don't want to be front line with anything. They don't want to go see what's really happening. They just want to see their project implemented and their dollars spent. Right. And you, you talk right, about right. that. Your, your colleagues talk about that a whole bunch. Expand on that. Well, can I say something real quick about uh, the, <laughs> the degree thing? This is what I yeah. mean by this. I don't, think, I don't think it's mad that bad that you have degrees. And I also don't no. think that not having is somehow a benefit. But what I'm saying is, is that if you, for most of your academic life, have always been right and you've always gotten A's, you don't know how to be wrong. And so if you're in the State Department, if you're in the government, if you're in the Army and you went to the Harvard School of Government, you don't know how to get stuff wrong. You don't know how to be the dumbest person in the room. You always know you're going to get an A. And you do it primarily by working hard. Shut up and do the work. Stop having ideas. Stop being the smartest guy. You've got a lot of stuff to figure out your way behind, right? You're getting an F the moment you walk into these classes. Well, this is not possible for someone who, I, I went to Vanderbilt. I don't care if you went to Vanderbilt. I care if you can respect this person who's the governor, the actual governor of the place that you're in. Can you show that person respect? Can you allow them to be that sword in the sky? Because if you can't, then it turns out your correlation to failure is greater than one because now you're failing at a rate that's 2x of what's possible. Right. Right. And right. people hate that. But the thing is, is if you're not that hard on yourself, then you're going to get it wrong because that's the first rule of instability or second rule is, is like you're getting it wrong. And if you're not getting it wrong, you're violating the first rule. Get shit wrong. I would certainly ask the degree people, would, OK, while you were getting your degree, how many jobs were you holding down? Right. Were you doing anything real world, right? whether it's waiting tables, whether it's in your industry, whatever it is, were you doing something like that? One of the things I noticed, you know, I yeah. have a. Have a I have a master's in computer science and I have a BS in computer science, you know, both from what were, was a top five computer science university at the time, UC Irvine. I think they're still up in the top 10, but um, they were training us to be, uh, they were training us for defense and aerospace between in the late eighties and early nineties. That's where all of our careers were going to be. You know, in 1995, I don't think I knew anybody that I graduated with who was in defense and aerospace. You know, we were all, we're all in small software companies or internet startups or whatever else, because that's what became hot. Nobody anticipated that. And I imagine the same is true, you know, of people who go to go to school, you know, for for government or, you know, get a degree in foreign relations or, you know, nation building or whatever they get their degree in. Probably didn't have much applicability to what actually happens on the ground, you know, and they go and they take their they, they take what they've learned and they try to apply it that way. Doesn't work out, you know, from the start. So I see your skepticism about that. I feel it. I learned this not by my own invention, but by, by uh, watching this mistake over and over again. And I'm like, wait a second. And, and I say it in a thing. 
working with State Department, working with USAID, it is intoxicating. You picture yourself being in some kind of exotic location and, and you're dining with the Taliban and all these things, right? So you do believe that you're doing something really neat and it's just, it's mysterious and it's exciting and you're almost a diplomat. Maybe you could become one. But the reality is, is that the State Department's terrible at their job. There's not enough of them. There's 5,000 people for the entire State Department. That's a brigade. And mm -hmm. how in the world are they going to cover a whole planet? You know, and, and a lot of it's administrative, like, let's get your passport fixed. Let's get you out of, you know, out of this place, this, this thing. So the amount of people that are actually working on policy things, it's not, it's not very big. So when you see the State Department, know that they, well, they are arrogant. They won't ever admit that they're arrogant, so they're ignorant. They have things they could absolutely do. But that's why I always ask them, like, hey, what's the furthest you've been off out, outside of uh, the headquarters here at the State Department folks? And it's never very far. It's maybe a mile away. Maybe. H how in the world can you stabilize an entire state if you only stay in the state capital? Right. I mean, Tom Clancy right. made a career out of basically writing about State Department people who got more than a mile away, right? I mean, yeah. Movies, books. Yeah. yeah, that's always an interesting, that's just an interesting proposition as is. And it's been an interesting proposition for what? Going on 35 years, right? I mean, and, and yet we still, we still have some incapacity to, to learn that that's an important, uh, important piece of things. You have a section called Ideas 2. Wow, this okay. is amazing. Like you're not done with Ideas 1. Your ideas suck. And, uh, the, you know, the more, they're, the more they're inspired by your books, the dumber they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ideas too. Reject Western ideas. When you hear or concoct them, be on alert. Yes. Well, the test is: is this initiative Afghan inspired, led, and provisioned? Right. Wow, what a right. great! They, they got to buy in. I mean, this is this is sales one hundred and one, Pete. Uh, <laughs> this is exactly kind of the thing. Yours, but these are not uncommon tools that I'm applying to this problem. And, and this is why it's a little bit frustrating. So one of the things that almost every unit says, this kind of goes to the upper part of the idea section where your ideas suck. What I see is a white hand clasping a brown hand and they shake on a PowerPoint slide. And if I see that, I, don't, I no longer slap my face. I just raise my hand and I say, how many units are going to have that same slide and fail at this? You know, And I say it in a nicer way than that. But we don't have time. We don't have time for these stupid ideas and stupid thoughts. Like, if you want to understand what the Afghans want to do, if you want to understand where they're at, you have to go out and talk to them. You have to. There's no other way around it. And you have to talk to them without knowing the first thing about what you're talking about because you, it's them. It's all of them. They're the ones holding the bag. If you're a commander, if you're a lieutenant, a colonel, a captain, wherever it's going to be, and your job is to create capacity, what capacity do you need, sir? What, what was the number one thing on your list? And if you don't ask them that, then you're going to come up with your own bullshit stuff. This is the ideas part. You don't know what they need. So quit, quit thinking that you do and ask them. Like when we go to, when we get ready to leave, Brad, one of the things we do is we go, surprise, we're leaving and we never come back. And that person's left holding the bag. We've never thought, like, where, where do we need to be and where are we trying to go? I've never seen this in a handoff either, right? It's, all, it's always like, this is this guy. And it's very simple handoff stuff. We never talk about, like, here's the capacity he already has. Here's what we're working on right now. Here are the areas that are troublesome. Here are the parts where we get in his way and I'm trying to fix these things. And that never happens in a handoff. It's very similar. It's a very basic thing. It's based on relationships and whatnot. So, we have to uninfect ourselves from, from these Western ideas. And that's why I talk about, you know, in the ideas section, all of these aspects where you think you know what you're doing, and I'm begging you to know that you don't. Pete, you bring up an interesting point there, which is handoffs are a mess. What, what do you think yeah. really happens if, say, Trump is president right now? I mean, he's the one who, he's the one who oh. wanted to get us out. And I, I, I don't argue with him wanting to get us out. I think yeah. we're spending a lot of money. Uh, we're not we're not losing a lot of lives. But we're spending a lot at this point, but we're yeah. spending a lot of money. Um, and, you know, are we going to have a permanent occupation? Is that what's going on here? It, he just said he said no. He said, no, this is ridiculous. So what happens if he's president right now and we we uh, we try to get I, out? I, I can't guess what comes out of the brain of Donald Trump, because let's understand whatever. No, good I mean, idea. Yeah, right. I mean, put but, put aside put aside that he's just kind of a he's kind of well, a no, buffoon but, sometimes. But buffoon, put that aside. He will purposely, he'll say, look at this. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot and pull us out of Afghanistan. So he'll purposely make a mistake 
Like, let me, I'm going to go focus. Here's this impossible project, right? With tens of thousands of people, dozens of countries involved. And, and here's what Donald Trump would do. He's like, I'm going to get in a fight with Rosie O'Donnell while I'm doing this. And it's yeah. stupid. It's stupid. Yeah. This is way yeah. too hard of a problem. So he would, without a doubt, screw it up. Every president basically would. There's no president in the recent past that would have gotten this right, you know, the withdrawal part. But here's the thing. Here's what you don't do. And here's why Joe Biden is uniquely affordable at this. If you're the president of the United States, you're the most powerful man in the world. You can change your mind. You'd be like, you know what? That was the last guy. We're going to do a different deal here. By the way, you kill one person, we're going to have a problem. It's going to be a lot harder to get us to leave. If you guys chill out, let us and our partner countries start to extract people, you guys can have your country back. But you get dicey, it's going to be a problem. Well, Instead, the fact was, walked away. The fact was, on the outside of airplanes, Brad. That's how yeah. bad this decision was. Yeah. Well, the, the fact was, is that Trump wasn't negotiating with the legitimate current government of Afghanistan. He was negotiating with the Taliban. He, he flew the Taliban in. And he, he, was, he promised to flow, fly him in for talks, and he canceled it because they, they, uh, they couldn't keep their people under control. You know, and then he flew him in for talks, and then they had a talk and an agreement. And Trump's even out bragging about you know, how he, he told him, uh, look, if you, if you cause us any trouble, I'm going to bomb your house first. You know, I mean, it's just right. That's like the Trump way to do it. But but I mean, aside from it, he's going to have the same he's going to have the same outcome because the handoff is is going to be it's 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 going to be the same mess. I mean, whether you do it in you know in a particular order or not, you're basically handing a country back to the Taliban. You know who we went. Yeah. The one thing Donald Trump might have done is he might have brought a business solution to it where it was it was like a, a Sicilian deal where you're like, hey, look, here's where you can make some money and we can all do this together if we work on this and then bring in partnered nations that way. He might have him and Jared Kushner might have pulled that off because that was one of the techniques they were doing with Israel. I don't know if that would have happened. Um, and it, certainly no one would have given him that win if he did pull it off. But that is the one thing he might have come up with to chill this area out. Um I think in the idea section, I talk about mining. Is that right? I'm not looking at it. Yeah, right that's now. you. You did talk about mining at some point, but I think it's actually. I think that's later. Oh, is it later? Okay, well, then we'll bring it. It in is later. later. Okay. What else in ideas to cover? I I think your your uh, if the response is okay, this is this initiative Afghan inspired, led, and provision. Response yeah. is yes, yes, and yes. Proceed with caution while while seeking to do provide as little as possible. Right. This is right. You're, you're right. The reward the win. And Pete, this is sales 101. I mean, this is if I'm trying to sell to you and it's a long process of a sale, I want to get you dependent on my product. I want to get you like loving my product and thinking of things you can do with it and then coming to you with, yeah, we can handle that for you and we can handle that for you because you built a relationship with us. Like I'm there to help you move, right. move along. And if you don't fall in love with it or whatever else. <laughs> I can't make you love it, right? I, I'll, I'll stand there and wait until you you have an opportunity where you need me. I mean, that's it, it, we we've we've certainly as a capitalist country, right? We've certainly not learned that lesson in how we conduct our foreign affairs. Yeah, and I, I put in there, and I'm sure no one clicks on it. Um, and I do want to acknowledge the joke about he hates these cans because that's that's one of the right. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely right. have this conversation all the time with people they'll like you know they think they've come up with this new angle on some but we'll get back to he hates these cans so in that there are two articles they're both from the same valley same time i was there one of them talks about mobile governance here's a great idea hey no one knows who the governor is so we're gonna grab this guy by the arm and take him village to village to and show him how to introduce himself to people well, what an arrogant and dickish thing to do to grab a governor. By the way, never schedule this with him. And if you do, you're like, hey, on tomorrow, we're going to go around village to village and introduce you to everybody. Like, it's just the shittiest thing you can do to someone who's trying to govern a region. I, I wouldn't let our guys do it when they try to do it. I'm like, hey, and I told the boss and the boss is awesome. The boss is like, yeah, they're not doing that. Do what Pete says. And so I'm like, Here, here's how we introduce these different areas. First off, what areas know the boss, know the governor? Well, we don't know. Well, what the fuck are we doing? You just picked out some villages on a, off a map? You know, like there's no intelligence in this, right? They just want to go take him around because we're doing mobile governance. It's bullshit, Brad. It's bullshit. Right. So this whole story right. celebrates mobile governance. And you can hear me 
right? If you read this thing, you'll read like, oh, and then we took him here and everybody loved the governor. Bullshit. It's all effect driven. There's no affect. There's no one going, hey, I didn't know we had a governor. Wow, this guy's great. I'll come to him with all my problems. That hasn't been created. That's not at all been how, created. So that's how, the affect how, versus how, effect. How, how important is the governor in their daily lives or was the governor? I mean, before. You know, one of my favorite you know, points to grab is to go, hey, uh, Farmer 15, how are you? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Have the conversation. Um, what happens in that building over there, right? And then they go, they say something incredible, but you're like nothing. The government never helps us. Oh, come on. The government's done one little thing. Is there anything? And then they either go, ha, 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 and they laugh in my face, which is a great, great data point and an affect-driven data point. Your government is a joke. Or they'll say, yeah, that guy owes me money. He, he grabbed a goat for me and hasn't paid for it yet. That's what the government equals to me, um, a, an unpaid PO, you know? So I, I don't mind being on net 300 days with the government. But at some point, that guy's got to pay me. And these things matter, especially to, to colonels, right? They're going to be like, what the hell? What do you mean the government isn't paying? So now we have a systematic problem. If you can't even pay for your own goats, well, then what is the government capable of doing? You know, that's the harder question internally, right? So that's one of the articles. And think about how screwed up this whole thing is. I just explained, you're going to grab this guy by the arm and take him place to place to place to place to show him off and introduce him. Is there anything more puppeted than that? And then how does he recover from that? Or do you even care? Two years from now, when he's like, yeah, I've been to this village 15 times. You guys take me every deployment. Uh, I don't want to go. I'm tired of doing this. This doesn't do anything. That's not how they build. Like we're, trying to, we're trying to build this government capacity by, by shoving someone down someone's throat. And it just doesn't work. By the way, this is important. In Afghanistan, you do not elect your county or state. I'm using American terms. You do not elect your county governor or your state governor. They are given to you by the very top, by Karzai or whoever is running the, uh, the country. Think about that. So this is not even a representative democracy at the ground level. And you still get to take, get take your goats. goats. Yeah, you still get yeah. to take your goats. So, so you, didn't even, you, you didn't even think about, you know, hey, hey, buddy, here's a hundred bucks. Or, you know, I've got small bills for you so you can pay for all the goats that you owe people. It'd be a really, really good, really good tour for you. We right. want to come do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Yeah. Or, or just say, oh, no, the government has been paying for goats. I'm positive if you go see him, um, he'll uh, he'll handle it. You know, if you know there's a budget there, right? You send everybody to the government to go do those things. But we never do that. Instead, we yeah. yank this. Person. So the other article is uh, a land dispute that had gone on for decades. And I was talking to the governor when he first started coming. He's like, this is my number one priority. It's the thing I want to do. I want to work on this land dispute. And that's all he really told me. He's like, all I need you to do is stay the hell out of the way. Don't come over for a couple of nights. I'll send for you when I'm ready for you. Okay, great. And so he does this. And literally, like, you know, they're getting takeout. I can see takeout arriving. And, I, and I'm saying takeout. I don't mean what we would recognize as takeout, but I see them getting takeout. People are bringing plates in. These are men shuring without us, right? And no one's like, this is the Mazan Shura. Nope, they're just doing it. And so they right, go through this right. process. And he's like, okay, tomorrow, I want you to come in right around noon, but I'll let you know for sure when I want you to come in and you can watch the end of this whole thing. And then I'll explain everything to you. And I'm like, well, this is like a big mystery. I don't even know what's going on. And so I, I come back, I'm at noon, I'm waiting. And then he, he waves to Fareed, my, my, uh, my interpreter, my partner. And he says, Hey, all right, come on in. And so we sit down and, and at my job. And I said, can I bring a cameraman? And he's like, yes. And your guys' job is to say nothing. And I'm like, perfect. Fareed can listen. You guys shut up. He'll take notes. Okay. I do what I'm told. You're the boss. You're the sword. And so what happens? Um, I see a bunch of guys, nom, nom, yes, yes, yes. And they're all like that. And then they start thumbing off on this piece of paper with their inky thumb. Right. And I have no earthly clue what just happened. I, I can't, I can't say, I don't speak the language. I, I'd never seen this before. And so what happens ultimately is, is that, okay, I use the power of the religion, Islam, to get these guys to calm down, come here and work on this dispute. We hashed out all of the individual grievances over the last couple of days. Well, we had, he's an imam, the governor was, and he's like, I had this higher level imam come in. He, he vouched off on everything that it was good. These families have all agreed that they're going to settle this thing and we've come to a resolution and everybody's happy with it. And I'm like, all that happened in four days, you know, or whatever it was. He's like, yes. And so because I asked I was able to get a cameraman there and he told this story, right? And it became a national level story on the Afghan side, not in America, no one in America cares. But look at this massive win. Here's what I had to do. Nothing. I had to shut up and stay out of the way until he told me to come in and shut up. Right. And, it's and nobody, 
nobody had yeah. a pinky cut off and taped to the contract. Nobody had a pinky cut off. Exactly. I didn't have to buy anything. The colonel didn't have to like buy a go at a ceremonial. None of that. We didn't have to do anything. And then one of the next things he did is like, I'm going to throw a party to celebrate this. What do you need me to do? Be my guest. And I'm like, well, I mean, be your guest. He's like, just show up, hang out with me. You know, and like, can we bring anything? American tradition means we have to bring something if we come to your party. Like, how about you guys bring water? Okay, great. Who's handling security? Like, we've got that. Stop thinking about all these things. This is a party. Nothing's going to happen. And so we do a party. We got this cultural win. And you know what I had to do? Nothing. And I'm like, who are your guests? Right. He's like, it would be great if the colonel came out and was my guest. What does he have to do? Nothing. Just be my guest. Hang out with me. That's it. And just don't accomplish anything other than coming to a party and being a guest. Okay, great. And so you have these two things, right? A and B. You have this forest governance thing. And then you have this powerful government thing. Which thing would you want 10 of? The, the thing that I did nothing for and we got all this national attention from the Afghans internally or, or this thing where every unit goes around and hauls people around the battlefield to show them where their, where their people are. I, I think if they approach you as friends, you know, I think you've, that's how you win, you know, because then you're, you're, you've got their ear for a solution, you know, when they need a solution. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Pete, I think it was probably 12 minutes ago. There was this little <laughs> segment of a sentence that you said. See, this, this is why I'm a good interviewer, dude, because I remember these yeah. little sentences. And you said, you said something about this is the governor going on his little tour, and the next deployment, they're going to take me on another tour. So let's, let's talk about that a minute, which is how does the short deployments, oh my God. How, does, how does that uh, uh, mess with our ability to do any, you know, have any kind of continuous, continuous effort, you know, uh, yeah. continuity, that sort of thing? I mean, look, it's, it's super colonial, but that's just how you have to do these things. And, and so you have to come back. I don't know any way you can do this other way. So first off, you don't need to learn the language before you deploy because you're going to deploy somewhere different each time. That's part of this one year deployment process. Right. So don't bother learning the language. Don't bother with that at all. Do that on your own time. And if you develop capacity, great. Uh, the army, the military can always supplement that by sending you somewhere. They hardly ever do this. So don't even worry about it. What you should get good at doing is working with an interpreter. So that way, no matter where you go, what language you encounter, what culture you encounter, if you have strong CQ, cultural intelligence, and strong interpreter skills, uh, both on the interpreter side and on the, uh, the operator side, you can operate anywhere in the world and, and mm -hmm. do so at a rate that's way faster than anybody you're going to encounter in the military because they're just not trained for it. So that's, that's the first thing I would, I would say to, to all of that. If you develop friendships, you're not going to transition them like you think you can because you're not there to protect the transition. And so mm -hmm. you can say, this is what I'm urging you to do. Please do this. Get this right. Understand who this guy is. This, trust each other. You guys are good people. All right, I'm leaving. I'll never see you again. Talk to you again. Bye-bye. And you leave. That is no way to transition anything. If you came back and you saw, if, if I switch out with you and you know that like we have to work together on this, you and I. I don't know the guy, three guys after us, right? Like if it's you, me, you, me, or three of us, we all know we have the ability to work together on this problem and slowly advance it. We don't because of how we approach this. And one of the things I want to do is I want to write a paper where I take a bunch of colonels like Xander and I go, okay, what was your career path? Like, And there's a fairly normal career path that people go on. And what you find out is, is they're not in the field much at all. Like they spend more time in a classroom getting a master's degree, a second master's degree, maybe even a mm -hmm. PhD, than they ever spend on the battlefield talking to elders and locals. And so this capacity they develop academically is far superior to their ability to go out and engage locals. And then they also don't do this local engagement often enough to become reliably good at it. So I was able to watch us make all these mistakes and go, okay, these are mistakes that I can simply eliminate by not saying these stupid things. Whenever someone says black and white hand and clasping on a PowerPoint slide, I can stop them from that. But even that took time to learn because then they're like, that guy's a dick. He's always telling us what not to do. You know, so I had to learn how to just go through the commander and have the commander just own the whole relationship and be like, do what Pete says and shut up. You know, we're going to get better fast here. Let's, let's let this guy help us. That sounds arrogant, but when you stay five, six, seven units in a row, you see it. You know, like, look, yes, Afghanistan and Iraq are different places, but we are not. We are the same organization. We make the same mistakes. I promise you when I go there, we will be just as big. So wherever we go next, wherever we are now, we are the same level problem. We are our own worst enemy. And that's the whole thing with all of this one year war stuff. Develop capacity in the area, return to it. The friends that you make, act like a friend and come back and see them. Act like a professional. Yeah. 
come back and be like, hey, here's what I've learned while I've been gone. What have you learned? But we yeah, never I certainly, I, I certainly find with, um, you know, sales oriented stuff that, you know, you develop you develop pretty strong relationships, you know, just being able to talk about just regular things with the people who you're selling, who you're selling to. And sometimes, in fact, this month, uh, organize, my organization hired two people to do what I do. Okay. And they are probably going to turn out to be way better at doing what I do than I am. And I'm totally cool with that. Totally cool with training, training them for it and, every, and everything else. But I'm also taking it upon myself to introduce them slowly to the customers that they'll be taking over some of my responsibilities for so that those customers feel like, you know, they're going to be in charge and they're going to be able to make good decisions and whatever else that they have my endorsement. That's, that's very important to me. Not that they just show up one day and say, yeah, Brad's busy with something else. We're, we're taking over, you know? And, and, um, mm. I, I feel like that's, you know, your, your, the deployment model where you're there for what is it? Nine months or a year or whatever. And then you're, you're out and the next guy's in, um, you know, in a 20 year mission, Somebody who's there 20 years is going to see 20, 20 peats, 20 different peats. Well, think some about them. are going to be too. good. Some of them aren't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, imagine if one of those peats is a Joe Biden level Pete. And this is not a knock on Joe Biden specifically, but let's just because he's a fool, a fool and he screwed things up all the time. That guy makes mistakes that you pay for two, three, four, five years later, but you never know about it because you never get to talk to Joe. You're just stuck with Joe. And so these things matter because. If you have one, your tours, and there are mistakes that are being made because you just don't have the capacity. The institution has never trained you. They don't know how to train you. That counts when you're out there doing this hard, complex stuff. And so that one-year deployment model doesn't work for that very reason because you just can't reliably get right enough things and you try everything and sense you to do the wrong thing. Everything is Western focused. Everything's about like, look, if, if a guy doesn't show up for a meeting, you get mad at him because they were unprofessional. Reality might be, Hey, you know what? It was dangerous. I couldn't come. Or, you know, my baby got sick. You know, well, your baby gets sick. What are you going to do? You can't come. You mm -hmm. got to take care of your baby. Everybody knows that. Not when you're deployed, not when you're in combat. You're not even good at being a human to the people that you're supposed to be. These are supposed to be partners, right? I'm not talking right. about criminals. Right. I, that's my job. I'll go deal with the criminals. I'll go find those guys and figure out what makes them tick and we'll figure out how to get them back over the bridge. But partners? It's on you to develop a real personal relationship. And if we don't focus on trust building and the ability to trust someone who's not like us, you cannot reliably get them from A to B. You're just right. going to cut right. them off at the heels and the next guy's going to come in and do the same horrible thing to them. Right. right. Again, it's a sales, Again, it's it's a sales problem, Pete. It's like you, you get it and lots of people don't. Um, we, got, we got time for two more little subtopics here. So one of them is the clouds and arrows. Okay. Metaphor that you use arrows and clouds, I guess, is how you, how you ordered it. Yeah. Explain. Well, <laughs> so the concept came up to me a long time ago is that we have, we have this, this is part of the affect effect conversation, right? We believe if we, um, so on the, if I can do this with my finger here. Okay. So we believe in the army world that if you just go tick, 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 tick with, with operations and effects up the scale across the screen, you will always win. This is an extra, uh, we do operation A, which leads to operation B. We will encircle operation C. We will, and then B, and then D, and then F and G, and then we will re-exfil to RTB America, and we will have won. Well, that, that's all bullshit. That doesn't work that way. That's arrow thinking. That's effect thinking. So you're shooting an arrow and trying to take down a cloud. You haven't even bothered to understand what it is that you're trying to improve, what condition it's in, what it might take, what the next step is. We don't think about any of these. This is a, look, I know you always say it's a sales problem and it absolutely is the same thing. But it, in sales, you already have so many assumptions made. Like, you know who you can call. You know you have to build rapport. You know you don't ask for the sale on the first phone call. All that stuff, right? You don't know any of this stuff in this case. You just know you have to go somewhere and create capacity. And then you're like, all right, well, what capacity do they have? What, what do they need? These are all the things I've been talking about. So, Arrows are our ideas. Arrows are our operations. And if we just shoot enough arrows, Robert Gates wants us to just keep shooting arrows. You know, the mm -hmm. bozo that's advising Biden clearly poorly, uh, that guy just thinks, he thinks if you just do this, if we just divide this on tribal lines, we'll have a state that, you know, bullshit, you don't know the first thing. You've just invented something that you cannot defend. You won't go do yourself. And then you won't pay me to go, hey, you know what? That's a terrible idea. Here's, here's what these guys recommend in this area. You know, they don't bother doing any of that stuff. 
So when people put a quiver of arrows in front of you, just laugh at them and go, you have no idea what you're doing. I'm going to go hang out in the cloud. I like how the uh, the eggheads don't have like, you know, like clean California, grew up in <laughs> northern or SoCal yeah. voices, you know, accents. No, they, yeah. They, they, yeah. they have those funny accents. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Last thing is, uh, this was an interesting discussion that broke out on Facebook as well. Um, security. You tell a you tell a story in um, uh, I think your previous essay about uh, a uh, a very important person who wanted to visit your your base inside the rope, and you told you told the security people don't don't do the whole search on him. You don't need to. This is how I'm going to build trust and whatever else. And you know there was there's another uh, another operator who you uh, you discussed things with on Facebook who came back and said. That's absolutely not worth the risk. What's what's the what's the trade off there? I mean, I I see his point. I mean, I don't want to get blown up, uh, but you know, I don't. At the same point, or at the same time, I see your point, which is this is not a guy who's going to blow himself up. There's no circumstance, and if I can't extend him a common courtesy of just you know trusting him here, how is he yeah. ever going to extend me the common courtesy of trusting my advice? So my with all due respect to my friend, he has no idea what he's talking about because he's not a field warrior like I am. He stays on the camp and handles things. And that's important. He needs to do that stuff. He's not supposed to know this. This is advanced. And I think I said to you, that's that's single A baseball. Yes, you're a pro and you're there. And, and I respect my friend completely for it. But this person is out of their depth in terms of talking about this. When I say VIP, I don't mean someone that's like, we call this guy shake. You know, I mean someone who's actually a VIP, especially if they're a member of the government. So let's say this in a different way. If uh, my representative's Katie Porter, if Katie Porter shows up to an American camp, is anyone going to frisk her? No, it's not going to happen, right? Uh, you don't so, need to turn into a Katie Porter joke, but hey, anyway, yeah, you're yeah, all good. Yeah. We're being nice. We're being nice. <laughs> I know. I know. So, so if if the legitimate government that we've installed shows up, right? If I invite someone, you know, the the governor of the the, the capital city, right? If I invite this person in, um, we're not going to search that person, right? Like, we're not going to, this person is from the government. If Karzai shows up, are we going to search Karzai? No. Okay, great. Well, what about the uh, the governor of the state that we're in? Are we going to search him? Yeah, probably not. Well, what about the governor from this distant, distant district? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. No, no, no. The answer is, no, we're not going to search them. They're a member of the government. This is their land. You know, they're there because they're, in, I invited this person. You can't search right. One that I invite because they're a VIP. This person is important. It's disrespectful to do it. If it's disrespectful to do it to John McCain or John Kerry, you cannot do it to the representatives or senators that show up from Afghanistan. You cannot do this to people and expect them to act in a way that's normal. You cannot do this to people and expect to get any kind of positive outcomes because we always did this whenever we had. Any, first off, we never thought to ever feed anybody from our own stock. We never thought to invite anybody to our camp. I, I don't. I know very few people that ever, ever, ever pulled this off or even thought to do it. So this is a very rare and advanced thing. But when they come on your camp and they see the air conditioning and they taste the ice cream and they fill their pockets full of muffins, it blows their minds. They and take the like, sugar packets and the coffee. Hey, the, whatever you the want. Coffee, a creamer. Not yeah. only that, like I need you to take some of the. Have you ever had co hot coffee? No, I've not had hot coffee in years. Have some of this coffee. Oh my God, this coffee's so good. Our coffee's terrible. I mean, I literally had a guy say this. Like our coffee's terrible compared to this. You have great coffee. Uh, one guy said the coffee was watery. That's fine. <laughs> but I'm like, take stuff. What do you need? You need a thermos. Let me get you a thermos. Let's make. How how would you treat someone? If John McCain came to your house, would you bend over backwards to show him how a great person you were and how great your cooking was and great, 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 great? You would. Bend I would over certainly be kind. Right. Yeah. You would, even if it's someone you didn't necessarily like, you would still be a good host. So why not yeah. be a good host to these people that come? Like you're, they're your guests. So when I say this, I'm not saying invite nefarious thugs onto the camp, which, by the way, I've done. But I also, again, I'm, a, I'm an inner circle elite level player at this, right? Like when I, what I say I'm doing, you probably can't do because this is a whole, there's a whole system and design of this. I'm not just doing this willy nilly. There's actual, right. there's a madness to my method. I agreed. But it does work. It's been tested over and over again, and it's born on the backs of a lot of extension of trust. So I, I'm very con smash cut to me getting blown up somewhere. But, you know, in the meantime, I'm pretty good at this. Right. So I can bring on criminals and and uh, and horrible people and do this with them because I understand the risk that's there. And I've built trust in a way that 
look, if I, if I put my life in an Afghan's hands and he says, you come to my place, I'm going to drive my, have my guys drive over, pick you up from the American camp and drive you to my place. Will we be safe? Of course you'll be safe. How can I not return the same favor to whoever I'm bringing on my camp? I'm going to extend mm-hmm. my protection to you, Amir. You know, and Amir's like, really? I'm like, yeah, no one's going to mess with you. You're my, you're my guest. How valuable is that to that person to know that? What, what, what affect did I just create with that guy who I just respected him and said, you have kids? Here, take some of this. Matter of fact, if I can, I'll bring you, you know me, I'm the ice cream man. I always give people ice right. cream. But we don't so, do this. We never yep. do it. I got one last, one last uh, little topic for you, Pete. It's not in your, not in your article, but one, one of the, one of the interesting videos that's showing up on the news is uh, the the us training the Afghan army and the dude doing the terrible, terrible jumping jacks. Like these people are going to be, they're going to be an army, really. Yeah. Um. One of the things that we remember because there's there were incidents like this over the twenty years was you know one of these Afghan army people you know just saying the heck with it and shooting up Americans. Um, I, yeah. They have a term for that, Pete. I think you know what it is. Yeah. I, yeah. How rare was that? I mean, was that, I, it, it seems like it must've been rare because we weren't hearing about it every week. You know, we were hearing right. about it maybe, maybe once a year when it was kind of in its prime, if that, and yes, there's those lives lost. It's terrible that they're lost, but you know, considering how much training we did of this Afghan army, I mean, how, well, look, it is a it is a tragedy and it's terrible. And one of the things that we'll say, and this is one of these axioms and, and, and traps that you hear, is like, we need more training. Okay, what are you going to do? Train what? What are you training? Oh, more cultural training. Like, it's just nonsense. It's bullshit. No one's actually thought it through and what you actually have to do to prevent this from happening. One of the things you can do is just be more human. You know, look, you're in a war zone. People are going to get killed for a variety of reasons. I guarantee you, Brad, I guarantee you that more people died wrecking their cars in a combat zone or committing suicide than we're ever killed by blue and green violence. It's a freak mm-hmm. thing. It happens, but it's a dangerous place. And so weird stuff happens. But, you know, there was, um, when the 82nd, I worked with them, the last guy, I believe the last guy that died, died because an MRAP rolled over because they were driving more than 15 miles an hour and made a turn. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, what do we do about that? Well, we quit driving MRAPs. Well, we're not going to do that. Well, we're not going to stop being in these dangerous places where people can turn guns on us. We, we are going to continue to, partner with people and give them loaded weapons. We have loaded weapons. They can trust us. We're supposed to be able to trust them. If we don't focus on building trust and get better at it, yeah, we're going to continue to get shot for in ways that are preventable. Can I prevent anybody from getting shot because of a trust building exercise? No, I can't. But I I, I can make it so that you understand like, hey, you have to be more human in these things. This mm-hmm. is it's combat and there's a lot of areas and things that you have to master to to be good at this. It's not straight you know, the company in the defense will be executed as such. It's not that. It's not that. There are elements of that, but the day-to-day operation, the primary thing, like I've talked to, and you know, you've heard this on the show, when I talk to operators, have you fired more bullets or had more conversations in combat zones? And they all, all but one say, I fired more, I, I had more conversations. conversations. Right. Yeah. So if you can't build rapport, then why are you out there? If you, if you can't talk intelligently about building rapport, building trust, testing trust, uh, elevating your trust level so it's a higher risk trust, then why are you in the trust building business? Don't do it. You're, just because you're a commander, find the most gregarious person you have and put that person to work. I don't care what their real job is. Their job should be engaging people. And really, commanders yeah. shouldn't be doing this stuff anyhow. It's, it's better to have someone else do it because commanders have too much influence when they show up. They screw things up. You need you need a guy like Pete who can go out and go, this is what I heard today, you know, yeah. fend that guy and let, and, and direct that guy towards where the questions are. And then they'll figure it out. Well, again, sales one oh one, And I think I'd point out that, you know, we've, we've had green on green violence too. you know, witness Chris Kyle. Well, and how about green on self green, you know? Right. Right. I mean, it's, what are we doing about that? More training. You're going to train someone to not be depressed and shoot themselves in a shit right. before Thanksgiving because their girlfriend left them. Okay. Right. You know, it's, it's just, look, yes, we don't want people to die, but people are going to die when we do this. People are going to hang on to the outside of airplanes when we leave. We're going to be bad at leaving. We're going to, we're going to abandon our allies. Mm-hmm. And when we do this all the time, we just walk out the door and never come back. Fix that. I've got a whole paper on transition operations and how to, how to work on some of these things and how to understand it. You know, read that for Christ's sakes. Get out and do some work that's not in the books that you're given at the schoolhouse because the institution doesn't know how to build people like this. Right. The State Department cannot build people. The State Department right now, 
when I when I was in when I was in Iraq, I know we're going a little bit long here, but it's my show, so I'm going to go long. When I was in Iraq, we had a thing called the Stefan Arch, also called Tak Al Kasra, right? That's in Arabic, and it's it's in the Baghdad province, and it's out in the farmlands, and it's a place with a shrine and a whole bunch of stuff. I've talked about this quite a bit, and so I said, hey, this thing unites all three populations in Iraq. It's a tourist thing, so we had the touristry uh, ministry, we had the antiquities ministry, we had uh, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense. A ministry of Education, all lined up, all the raids saying, hey, we want to do this. We want Kurds involved. We want Shia involved. We want Sunni involved. All these people want to do this. America, can you help get us over the hump? One of the things we need is a professor. Oh, Pete raised his hand. I've got a professor who's willing to come down here and start working on this project, but he's got to figure out money and everything else. I get on the phone. I call the Dix State Department. They're like, we're too busy. That's not important. Goodbye. And this is the guy in charge of antiquities in Iraq. You know who yeah. runs that stuff now? Just guess. Just guess. One of Saddam Hussein's kids. Well, Iran. So, oh, Iran. Either. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Kuse, is that what their name Iran was? Iran put, put together an international coalition to take this thing and make it, protect it, and study it. I mean, you yeah. couldn't get a, a, a... This is a football rolling towards the end zone. All you have to do is just fall on it, and it's going right. to be a win. And the State Department couldn't fall on a fucking football. Yeah, but you I know, mean, that's that's actually a pretty difficult move in football, Pete. I mean, what? what okay, right? <laughs> it's a cupcake yeah. in front of a fat guy, right? right. All you've got to right. do is put the fat fuck, cake, a cupcake in your mouth, and you will right. have a cupcake in your mouth. It was right. on a right. tee. You don't have to even be a good golfer. You can. It's it's a free throw, and you're one inch away. Whatever the easiest thing is that you want to do, that's what it was, and they fucked it. And you know who they gave the win to? The Iranians. Yeah, which you know, is. The stupidest Wrong. thing you can do in Iraq is give the Iranians more influence and more wins that were ours. Is, right. is Iran going to study that arch better than we are? Hell no. No. So when I get fired up about these things, because this is simple, you mm -hmm. cannot act in this way and go and we cannot insert ourselves into problems that we're not willing to take seriously. If you're not going to take seriously these problems culturally, if you're not going to take these wins seriously, then don't go and accept that babies are going to get killed. And women's rights are not going to get advanced because like John Green said, you cannot push an urban progressive agenda on rural conservative people. It just mm -hmm. won't reliably work. Yeah. By the way, Dickie's a badass. He's been talking the whole time and I've been running my app too much to engage with him. But Dickie, what up, man? I, I, I love you being there. He's got some great uh, comments. But can I put this? Uh, I'm going to put this chart up real quick. I know it's kind of way okay. past time, but I crashed my computer trying to get it. So All right. this chart here. Oh man, that's not in the wrong spot. You know what? Never mind that thing. All right. Uh, at, at Pete, a, Pete at breakitdownshow.com, and I'll, I'll email it to you. That is the chart that I got from the governor on how to, uh, how to fix his, uh, how to fix that's, his area. It looked, it looked fine if you made us disappear. Can you do that? Oh, I guess I could do that. Yeah. So what do you think, Brad? How did I do? I mean, how, how we, I lay this out. I know it's all sales stuff, but no, no, no. Timelines aren't okay. Timelines like that aren't sales stuff. Timelines like that are sales management. I mean, in stuff. general, for the whole the whole thing, the whole like program that I we just talked about, this writing, this effort to try to create this knowledge. Yeah, that's craziness. That's 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 there's a lot of points of failure in that chart, Pete. You know, and then I don't mean the chart. I mean, in, I mean, like the whole program, oh. like the, the Afghan constant. You know, this model. Yeah, I, I've, yeah. I, I think you're. I think you're right. We we certainly weren't going to do this for 50 years. Um, there was going to be a there was going to be a time when we got out because we got tired of it or got too expensive or whatever else. And we obviously weren't going to do a good job of transitioning it. If we could do a good job transitioning, it would have been done 10 years ago. And yeah. that's that's unfortunate. You know, and we find ourselves in a in a much bigger mess now than we were, you know, to begin with. And that's that's unfortunate as well. The wrestling tournament that perfect <laughs> right yeah, in the middle notice, of that yeah notice that the wrestling tournament doesn't have anything from us at all you know like there's just no requirement from from our efforts you know there's so many things where we just and i even got the police the police are in there too anyhow that's that that's that plan and it's stuff like that that no one else does because no one else is trained on it no one else has stayed in the field like i have I can, that's why I'm able to say I'm inner circle with my ability to do this because I've seen us screw this up. By the way, just for anybody who hasn't seen this before, when I presented this to the army, they said, he didn't make this chart. 
I'm like, yeah, I know I made it. I made it. No, like, well, it's not real. And I'm like, no, it is real. Like, well, how do you know it's real? I'm like, because when he told me where to, where to put everything, I made the chart correctly. And then I screwed it up on purpose and I handed him the screwed up chart and he corrected my mistakes and he put it back in the order that he said in the first place. Mm -hmm. So again, like not only did I think to do this, not only did I manage to pull it out of him, not only did, did I put it into a format that he could understand as an Afghan, but also the army. But I also pre thought ahead what the army was going to say to me because I knew they wouldn't believe me, you know? And then did we follow this plan? Fuck no. No, of course <laughs> no. not. We of left. Not. We left and we, and we got, we got some uh, blue on green violence. We lost three, uh, three veterans or three soldiers out at mm -hmm. a checkpoint because we, um, we didn't take this stuff seriously. And it, it, look, it's not any one person's fault. But that's the institution. It fails at, at creating this kind of stuff. I, I don't want to talk the whole damn day, but, you know, what else do you have for me? You're, you're fired up, Pete. I, I think we've, we've concluded this in a nice way. Like, you, you actually, your conclusion is great. I'm going to read it to you, uh, okay. at least first paragraph. Okay. Slow down, get small, look for invisible winds. Don't be a dick. Listen more than you talk. Nothing's easy. Everything demands a deliberate, delicate, and chari focus. What's sure. that even mean, Pete? It's a very cautious approach to things. Got it. Okay. Chari focus. Okay. The less you using those, those uh, PhD words with me, the less you do, the less you fuck up. Now that is entirely true in most human endeavors. You know, if you can just sit back and, you know, let things flow where they're going to flow, you're not going to screw them up. Fucking up less is how you win. Exactly. You never know enough. And what you know is perishable. Yes, affect is also a noun. Oh, by the way, this is a little star. Yes, affect is also a noun. You don't like it. Forget what you know. This is Afghanistan. And that's the point. It's like you just, you know, show up and help. You know, it's like don't show up with, don't, don't show up and, and help, you know, pour gas on the fire. I mean, that's, that's, a great, uh, that's a great line for any activity. So, yeah. Pete, and by the Pete, way. No, no one's going to hire me to do this, by the way. I, no, 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 no. I can lay all this shit out and be like, right. look at all this help I can provide. And they're like, who's Pete? They didn't even say that. They didn't even listen. So, so this whole, it's, this is how much of a part in the world this is. Like, I'm going to make these things because I care and I'm passionate about it. I mean, you can tell that I am. But, right. But no one, no one who needs to get this right cares. No one who's a paycheck or a checkbook cares. Well, you know? we're, we're beyond getting this right. I think the, the, the key is, is kind of learning what to be skeptical of so we don't do this again. Or maybe we do it, we do it less bad the next time, or we know it, maybe we know what we're getting into. Uh, for instance, the original mission with, with Afghanistan sold the, to the American people was kill the terrorists, kill the terrorists, um, get rid of the Taliban who is harboring them. And uh, then the secondary mission was fight the terrorists over there. Now, how does this not turn into nation building? And how does that nation building not turn into the big cluster F that it did? Well, it was supposed to be state building. It was supposed to be a coalition of forces. We were right. going to go in. This is all part of the Bush doctrine, right? And to go right. out and create freedom and attack um, terrorism where we could find it. Now, some of that stuff's bullshit because we didn't go to Ireland and invade them. We didn't go invade Saudi Arabia. We right. didn't invade right. Iran. But how could but we how, just stick? How could we just stick to that? We couldn't. Well, we 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 were never gonna. I mean, I think that's right. a fallacy. I don't think that that's actually correct. Just like when we say nation building, it's state building. It's not nation building. And, and state building, how do you go to a place like Afghanistan and leave and expect not to have to come back if you aren't mm -hmm. ready to do some state building? But we didn't um, do that. We always say state building, and this was the mission. Uh, okay, yes, there are multiple things that happen, but for sure. I mean, just go back and listen to George Bush talk about this. The Bush doctrines put out in that big speech, he said. I mean, he talks about it. From This is, this is in the big speech right after 9-11. Yeah. So he, he talks about state building. He talks about creating this capacity, but he also talks about going to where the terrorists are and getting in front and going after them, not having them come after us. So, yeah. so there is some mission creep, of course, but we, we have to understand that we got this wrong more than we missed on the mission creep part. We, we, we didn't get right the original mission in the first place. Yeah, I, that's my point, is that it, it, the, the mission creep was inevitable from it. And the, the, the ultimate cost in terms of time and lives and dollars and whatever else was going to be what it was going to be. Yeah. It, was, it was not going to be a, you know, a, a quick, isolated exercise to take care of a problem. Yeah. Pete, you're, you're awesome, dude. You make it real, real easy to uh, host a show. I couldn't ask for an easier show to host. I just, you know, hand you softballs and uh, you, go, you go wild. <laughs> so uh, thanks, thanks, for making me, thanks for making me a great host. I'm, I'm at least in the top 10 of Break It Down shows. I'm, I'm happy with that. 
engagement, maybe lower. <laughs> <laughs>